The captain has turned on the no smoking sign. Gone is the golden age of travel where passengers could request cigars by a helpful flight attendant who would also provide a light. Gears up, light up was a common term in the era when smoking in confined spaces like elevators was commonplace. The first half of the 20th century was covered in tobacco-filled haze of smokers getting their nicotine fix at will while sharing their vice with non-smokers who were unfortunate enough to be trapped in confined spaces inhaling secondhand fumes. These days, airline passengers rarely witness the sight of the ashtray embedded in the arm of their seat as it's sealed shut as a relic of this bygone era of smoke-filled skies. Passengers these days who decide to light up in flight are more likely to face fines and handcuffs instead of a smiling attendant passing out matches. What happened to change the habits of in-flight smoking and shifted the balance to cater to the non-smoking crowd of airline passengers worldwide? Find out on this episode of Black Box Down. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Black Box Down. It's Gus and Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi. We're here with a supplemental episode. Everything you ever wanted to know about smoking on an airplane, but were afraid to ask. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask. <laughs> uh, before we really dive into it, I, I feel like I should mention I had a cold last week and I lost my voice. You sound good, and though. Thank you. It started coming back. And then at work, we played a video game yesterday that made me scream <laughs> a lot. And uh, it's kind of it's kind of borderline now. So if I sound a little strange, uh, that's what it is. You can blame a, a video game called Pico Park. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that's a... I, I, I know you've played Pico Park. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know you know what that game's how, how frustrating that game can be. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, we're going to talk all about smoking today before we dive into it. Of course, I want to remind you to uh, give us a follow at Black Box Down Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I don't know if we'll be able to post for this episode. Maybe if we can think of, we'll think of something to post. We'll find something here. to post. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I also want to shout out uh, for anyone who is a, a first class uh, supporter of the show, or you. Um, you can do that blackboxdownpod.com or, or Rooster Teeth First. Um, we have a new uh, uh, first class episode that we're going to record at, right after this. So uh, heads up for that. They'll be coming out shortly. And thank you for your support. Yeah, we appreciate it. And of course, you can also directly support and get that uh, directly in Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well, I believe. Yeah. So I'm a little older than you, Chris. So I'm going to presume that you have never smoked on a plane. You're not a smoker to begin with. <laughs> I, no, I've never smoked on a plane. You've There's lots seen, of things I've never smoked on. <laughs> You've probably never <laughs> even seen someone smoking on a plane, right? Not that, not from memory. It, maybe when I was a kid, there might have been some time. I'm not sure, but I, I don't have any memory of people smoking on a plane. I didn't really start traveling until I was older. I grew up in a really small town. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I never... Even though I'm a little older than you, I don't think I ever saw anyone smoke on a plane. Um, but of course, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen it, and there's ashtrays on the plane. Yeah. Like, there's, there's still remnants. Some of the planes that you still fly in are old enough where people probably smoked in them at one point back in the day. <laughs> but, like, how does that happen, right? How, we're going to talk all about how that transition happened and uh, how we ended up where we are today. Yeah. So, right off the bat, I, I, I got to say, until 1971... Most airlines allowed unrestricted smoking, both in the cabin and on the flight deck. So what happened actually was it was flight attendants who were led by an activist named Patty Young, who herself was an American Airlines flight attendant, began fighting for the right to work in a tobacco-free environment. And that movement started in the summer of 1969. Um, the yeah. flight attendant sought and they obtained assistance from health advocates to promote their fight to breathe clean air in airline cabins. And... It was these efforts that kind of built that momentum to start that advocacy for smoke-free flights um, everywhere. And that was what year, did you say, 19? They started that the summer of 69. Summer of 69. And so previously, cigarettes and smoking was just allowed in every commercial flight? Oh, or yeah. Well, but the, 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 remember, the, the advocacy started in 69. Uh, the restrictions started in 1971. So up till that point, it was, yeah, I, you smoke. Smoke them if you got them. <laughs> so like, uh, yeah, I guess I was wondering is like if there was a transition period whenever they first started letting people onto planes like commercially to like the early, early days where it was like a new thing. And then at some point they're like, oh, yeah, we need to we need to have let people smoke cigarettes if we want to, you know. If I were to guess when it for because, you know, aviation, com, you know, passenger aviation started in the early 1900s. I'm going to bet they didn't even give it a second thought at first. It was like, yeah, why wouldn't people smoke on the plane? You know, it was just That's crazy, you know, just smoke, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think as time went on, people really started thinking about it and, you know, 
creating changes. And even the process of, I, I don't know how much you've thought about this, but going from mm-hmm. you could smoke on a plane to no one can smoke on the plane. That was a long process, Chris. There were many <laughs> steps involved to get there. Uh, and we're going to talk about all of that uh, here in this episode. But the first airline to create a non-smoking section uh, was United Airlines in 1971. And uh, they were followed by an airline called, and I'm going to say this wrong, I don't know how to say it, Origny Air Services, who uh-huh. banned smoking entirely in 1977. I had to do some digging. I didn't know <laughs> who Origny Air Services was or where they were based out of or anything. It's an airline that's based out of the Channel Islands. And I read that and I thought, I don't know what that means either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's the English Channel. There, it's uh, okay. the islands off the coast of France, between France and England, uh, specifically kind of off the coast of Normandy. Um, so it was a small, relatively small airline, but they banned smoking entirely in 1977. So they, they get the, uh, the, the footnote in history as being the first airline to entirely ban smoking. Wow. But that's, er- that's early, that, 1977. That is, er- that, that is early. That's earlier than I would have thought. Yeah. Then, for comparison... Uh-huh. In 1994, Delta became the first U.S. airline to ban smoking on all flights worldwide. Wow. So there was a big gap there. <laughs> See, that's actually later than I thought. I was thinking it was, we might have talked about this at some point, but I was thinking it was like late 80s, early 90s, like, but more towards late 80s that they banned it, but I don't know. And remember, Delta was the first. <laughs> so that's there, crazy. Were still, there were still others going on uh, at that point. Uh, and I decided to do like cross reference uh, some figures here. So uh, I looked up on the American Lung Organization's website, and in 1970, 37.4% of Americans smoked. And that number has fallen. The most recent data they had available online was for 2018, and that number had fallen down to 13.7%. That's a, that's a pretty big decrease. I mean, it's un, it's not surprising, but. Yeah, because I started wondering, you know, how many people were, because I, you know, like how many people were smoking on a plane? Was it the majority of people who were smoking and the minority, you know, like a small number of people who weren't smoking? Like I was trying to yeah, just like figure it out what it looked like in my head. Uh, so those are the numbers I came up with. It is interesting though. W- w- what was the, that, that uh, 30 something percent? What year was that? 37.4% in 1970. So it's interesting that before like the first uh, discussion about having a non-smoking section Still, it was still like a third of the population. So there was like two thirds yeah. of the population putting up with smoke, secondhand smoke, no matter what, if they wanted to fly on a plane without any option. It's it's, it's interesting that that it's that the discrepancy of you know it's not even the majority. I think it seems strange to us now because of the, yeah. the the rules we have in the world we live in. But I think at the time it was just something that was commonplace. Like I think about when I was younger and I would go out to bars in downtown Austin before there was a smoking ban and, you know, any people could just smoke in bars. Like I wasn't a smoker, but like it, I never gave it a you second never thought. thought about it was, it, yeah. Right. It was like, yeah, we're in a bar. Of course people are smoking. What's the big deal. And I remember when they, you know, started talking about making a smoking ban in bars, even though I wasn't a smoker, I was like, Oh, that's kind of weird. You know? Oh, well. Uh, yeah. So I think it was, it was probably something similar where it was just very commonplace everywhere and no one yeah. really, but most people probably didn't even give it a second thought. If you went somewhere public, like a restaurant, or there's just going to be smoking, and that's just right the way of life. Okay, right. You're just used to it. So, the fight for smoke-free skies was, you know, was wrought with those unwilling to upend the status quo, and there were, of course, counter campaigns funded by big tobacco and even the airlines themselves. And consumer advocate Ralph Nader started petitioning the FAA to ban smoking on aircraft in 1969. The FAA never responded to the petition, citing a lack of evidence that tobacco smoke was harmful in the concentrations experienced on aircraft. So their rationale was that, you know, even if tobacco smoke was harmful, there's no evidence that it was concentrated enough in a plane to be harmful to anybody on the Mm. plane. And of course, the airlines are going to say that. They don't want to say they have an unsafe environment. Yeah, they'd say that regardless because then they they don't want to be liable (laughs) for any, yeah. Uh, and that name, Ralph Nader, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with Ralph Nader. Uh-huh. Uh, he, uh, he wrote a book that came out in 1965 called Unsafe at Any Speed. And it's because of that book, which led to the passage of the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, which led to safety standards for motor vehicles and road traffic. It's basically because of him that cars got seatbelts. 
Okay. Yeah, I know the name and I know him like, pa- you know, in passing through conversations yeah. and things, but yeah. So he was a big cool. consumer safety advocate. You know, he'd already done a lot of work to make cars and driving safer. So I think, you know, this was something that seemed like a next step for him. He's like, what else can I help? <laughs> <laughs> His whole story was crazy. Like I did a little bit of reading up. Like I probably like you, I kind of knew a little bit about Ralph Nader, but I did some digging and some reading. Uh, when his name popped up uh, for this, I was like, oh, there was a lot more to his story. I didn't know. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, highly recommend you you uh, look up some information on Ralph Nader. Very interesting story. Anyway, um, these two sides, right, uh, who were dealing with the, the, the movement to, to ban smoking on planes, both sides searched for health research to confirm their stance. Mm-hmm. And the first break for non-smokers came with the publication in 1986 of the National Academy of Sciences report on airliner cabin environment, which recommended banning smoking on all commercial flights. So, you know how I said the airlines were said that it wasn't dangerous on the plane. There was no scientific evidence, right? Nobody had Mm. done the research. It wasn't until 1986 that finally there was clear research that said, hey, um, this is not safe. (laughs) Yeah, something they could point to and be like, no, yeah. And then then, to your point, then once that comes out, I think airlines know like, oh, now we can be held liable because it has been proven. Yeah. So 1986, and then the first the first banning was in wait 71. Yeah, 71 was the first non smoking section section on section United. for section. Right. Okay, wow. And the first banning was that Channel Islands airline, uh, Origny from 1977. And airlines were reticent to pull back on smoking because they didn't want to lose customers. Right, and I mean it's the whole if it ain't broke, don't fix it mindset. Mm, okay. You know. Why yeah. spend any money to change anything when yeah. <laughs> everything's fine the way it is? Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, the FAA was kind of unwilling to regulate in-flight smoking. So advocates turned to the Civil Aeronautics Board uh, to petition for relief. Uh, the Civil Aeronautics Board does not exist anymore. It was an organization that existed back then. Uh, it went away when airlines were deregulated. But at the time, uh, the CAB was charged with the economic regulation of airlines and was located within the U.S. Department of Commerce. In 1972, in response to another Nader petition, citing polls indicating that 60% of passengers were bothered by smoke in airplanes, the CAB issued a rule requiring airlines to provide separate sections for smokers and non-smokers and banned cigar and pipe smoking on aircraft. So Hmm. at first, FAA really wasn't doing anything. So, you know, these people who were trying to make movement, you know, started trying to get the attention of the Civil Aeronautics Board. And the Civil Aeronautics Board kind of started the process, Hmm. you know. Let's, let's at least have smoking and non-smoking sections and no more cigars or pipes uh, on a plane. This might be obvious to some, but like, is, is a, a pipe or a cigar worse, like smoky-wise? Uh, yeah, and it's a lot stronger, uh, okay. like the smell. So the smell and just like the, the yeah. thickness of the smoke. And, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, I've, I don't know. I don't think I've ever been around anyone who smokes a pipe, but I have been around cigar smokers, and it is definitely a lot stronger. And that's, I mean, I've smoked a cigar too in my yeah, life. I'm yeah, not I a mean, smoker, I, but it's like, I'm sure, I'm sure there's incriminating photos of me smoking a cigar <laughs> somewhere. I'm yeah, sure it's happened probably five times in my life. I've smoked, I'll, I'll, I've smoked cigars, you know, on occasion for like, you know, it's a yeah, bachelor I'm not trying party to, or a wedding or something. And you yeah, know. I'm not trying to take like some sanctimonious high road yeah, here yeah. I'm the <laughs> so congressional action in 1987 led to a ban on in-flight smoking and this is when the crazy <laughs> set of rules starts chris so in 1988 mm-hmm. airlines based in the united states banned smoking on domestic flights of less than two hours banned smoke okay so less than two hours less than two hours can't smoke on it 1988 then in February of 1990, they extended that. So you could not smoke on domestic flights less than six hours. Oh, they're doing the creep. They're doing the creep, Chris. And think about it. What's really, what's a six-hour domestic flight in the U.S.? To Hawaii? Uh, Maybe, um, yeah, to Hawaii. Maybe New York to L.A.? Yeah, even that. I don't know. I don't think their flights are that long. Yeah, it's, yeah, now now they're pretty, they're pretty, this is pretty much like, Banning it without banning it. Yeah, continental U.S. banning. (laughs) Right. So that, what we said, was February 1990. And then the ban on smoking extended to all domestic and international flights in 2000. 
all domestic so, and international. So 2000 was whenever they way actually more recent banned everything. That is right. <laughs> that seems way more recent than I would have thought. Like that, that's super recent. Granted, I probably, I don't, I don't think I was on any international flights before 2000. So my first international flight was in 2004. Yeah. And I could see that being where, you know, people, th- there would be that last like rim of, of smoking, you know, because they're such mm-hmm. long flights. You can have a, you know, 15 hour flight and they're b- a lot on bigger planes. So, mm-hmm. so this, this ban that started, uh, well, I guess let me, the ban from 1990, the one for flights of uh, six hours uh-huh. or less, that ban applied to all the passengers and the cabin of the aircraft. All the passengers in the cabin, but not, but not the pilots. The pilots. The pilots were still allowed to smoke after the 1990 <laughs> ban. <laughs> what are y'all doing up there? Like, they come out of the cockpit. It's just like, <laughs> like <laughs> it's all smoky. <laughs> Yeah, they got like a little uh, little uh, glass of whiskey and a big cigar. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, the, the, they, the reason the pilots were allowed to continue smoking was there were concerns about potential flight safety issues because of nicotine withdrawal in chronic smokers. Oh, yeah. I mean, that especially for like long flights and stuff. Right. So I'm going to read a quote here and then I'm going to tell you who said it. And this is the quote. If, in fact, a cigarette is helpful to the pilot and co-pilot in a stressful situation, let them have it. This is a quote by Dave Brenton, who is president of the Smokers' Rights Alliance. (laughs) (laughs) And then he goes on to say, I just wish people were as sympathetic with airline passengers who find the flying experience a stressful one. I, Hey, I will say this. If a plane is having big issues and it might go down and and the pilot, it's going to help him to light a cigarette. I would be okay with it in that instance. Chris, wouldn't it be funny if there was like, you know how uh, there's like glass boxes and like in case of fire, break glass and it's got like a fire extinguisher <laughs> in it. Or it's like in case of crash, break glass and there's like a cigarette in there and a lighter. <laughs> and then, and then, and then behind that is another one with a fire extinguisher in case the fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh uh, my goodness. Some of the rationale here, I'm going to read some of this rationale, um, was that the flight deck of the aircraft is better ventilated than the passenger cabin and has a separate air circulation system that does not mix with that of the cabin. And that's according to Dr. Andrew Horn, who was an official of the FAA's Office of Aviation Medicine. So they were kind of making exceptions here um, in order to uh, allow the pilots to continue smoking, uh, circumventing the ban for a while. Yeah, and, and how how... The air circulation, just in general, was it like filtered and cleaned up, or or or, or so uh, circulated? That, like how? I I actually don't like that statement. Um, this was from an interview that I pulled out from the New York Times at the uh, back at the time. There was a story about it, and I feel like this statement is a little too broad mm-hmm. for for my liking because, as we've talked about before, every type of aircraft or every different model of plane, they're a little different. Remember, yeah. we talked about even one incident where the pilots thought that the bleed air came in from one engine, but it had switched on mm-hmm. that model and it came in from the other engine. Like things change. I mean, saying, having a blanket statement like this is a little misleading to me. Yeah. Um, but I think that the spirit of what the this what Dr. Andrew Horn was trying to say is that in general, there could be separate air circulation systems in the cockpit. Just like, for example, if there's a fire on the plane and smoke gets into the passenger cabin, there's probably a separate feed for mm-hmm. the air going into the cockpit so the pilots can continue yeah. to operate and land the plane. Um, probably something to that effect, yeah. uh, as I imagine what, what they're trying to get at here. That makes sense. But is it filtered, like, if someone smokes? Like, back in the day when people were smoking on the plane, would the air get sucked up and then filtered back out because... Before it gets... As it stands, even nowadays, the air is circulated through constantly in the cabin of a plane. The plane, in very simple terms, leaks a lot of air. (laughs) Uh, So even though the bleed air is constantly being air conditioned and pumped into the plane, a ton of it's still escaping out of the plane at the same time. And we've talked about how those pressure release valves and the the air goes out. So even if it's not being filtered, it's probably being vented through very quickly. Okay. I don't know that there were specifically any smoking filters. I doubt there were. 
but it was probably just the fact that air gets circulated through so quickly. Okay. So by a vote of 198 to 193, the House amended the fiscal 1988 Department of Transportation Appropriations Bill to ban smoking on airline flights of two hours or less. Uh, the bill was sent to the Senate and passed by a margin of 84 to 10. So it was a very close vote in the House, five votes difference, wow. but then you know passed overwhelmingly once it got to the Senate. And the ban on smoking aboard U.S. domestic flights of less than two hours went into effect April 23rd, 1988. It was meant to last for two years, expire in April 1990, and then face reconsideration. Uh, and we talked about that. They updated in February 1990. And at the time, it levied penalties of $1,000 for passengers who smoked on short flights, $2,000 for anyone who tampered with, disabled, or destroyed lavatory smoke detectors. Uh, and after the 1988 smoking ban went into effect, airlines like Northwest used it as a marketing, marketing opportunity, implementing a total non-smoking policy on its domestic flights. So I think that was kind of smart of airlines like Northwest. Like They see the mm -hmm. writing on the wall. They know that this is coming. Yeah. So why not get ahead of it and then try to use it to your advantage and, and mark it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, you know, really forward looking on their part. One of the sponsors of the bill, uh, Richard Durbin, who was a Democrat from Illinois, said that smoking poses a health hazard to the non-smoker who must sit in the company of someone smoking. Uh, and on the other side, there was an opponent who was Harold Rogers, who was a Republican from Kentucky, who said a ban would jeopardize flight safety by forcing some passengers to smoke surreptitiously in airplane bathrooms, which is kind of the fear right yeah yeah i guess that's kind of a a backwards way of safe of approaching safety you know where it's like well it, we want to be safe by allowing people to do things that are gonna uh <laughs> like so that they don't do something illegal that could jeopardize people i don't know yeah. but i get it yeah and in fact so you know, reading this made me start digging through the incidents, Chris. Mm. In 1973, uh, there was a case involving a lit cigarette thrown into a lavatory waste bin, which led to a cabin fire, which uh, led to Varig Flight 820 crashing. Oh. The flight was headed to Paris from Rio de Janeiro and it had to make an emergency landing in a field near Orly Airport. And in that crash, 123 people lost their lives and only 11 survived. Wow. Uh, of which 10 were crew members and one was a passenger. I thought that was the really that, interesting note there. That is interesting. Note there. Yeah. That's unusual. Yeah, it's really unusual. And the reason is before the... Oh, the fire was... Yeah, many passengers had died of carbon monoxide poisoning in the cabin. As you said it and we were moving on, I was like, it's probably because the fire's in the back of the plane and the crew's right. in the front. Right. Uh, and then this crash was, you know, like I said... Um, it's one of it's, this is one of those crashes where they cannot 100% say it was the cause of the crash, but all evidence points to that there was a, a cigarette disposed of in a lavatory waste bin, which led to this cabin fire. And this incident, Varig Flight 820, is the reason now that there are placards, even still to this day, in the bathroom telling you not to throw cigarettes into the trash bin. I'm sure you mm. see them anytime you're in, yeah. in the bathroom on a plane. And it's also the reason that you still they still do the announcements saying smoking is prohibited in the lavatories. Yeah, even though like to like, this day now, fifty years later, <laughs> they're still telling us that because of this crash. This episode of Black Box Down is brought to you by Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with dinners that work for you, not the other way around. Uh, they've got Green Chef has options for every lifestyle: keto, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, gluten free. Uh, you name it, they got you covered. You can shake off winter with delicious, easy to follow recipes that support your healthy lifestyle. They taste good too, so make sure you bring more flavor to your table this spring with Green Chef's wholesome, elevated recipes featuring seasonal, organic produce and unique farm fresh ingredients. I think uh, getting a Green Chef delivery is absolutely awesome. I love it. I'm always super excited. Run down, uh, open up the box, go through it, figure out what I'm going to cook first. Uh, and you know, in the end I win because no matter what I pick there, it's all awesome. And, uh, I get to put it all together, make fun. It's like a fun little project. And when I'm done, I get to eat the project and enjoy it because it's delicious. So go to greenchef.com slash black box down 60 use code black box down 60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Again, that is uh, greenchef.com slash black box down 60 use code black box down 60 to get 60% off and free shipping. Uh, green chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. I don't know about you, but whenever I envision myself running errands, it almost always includes me getting into my car, driving to wherever I'm going. But thanks to electric e-bikes, that doesn't always have to be the case. 
The all-new Expedition by Electric is the cargo e-bike designed to carry more so you can take a trip to the store, to the post office, or run other errands. Enjoy the fresh air in the meantime. I actually just took mine the other day down to a, uh, a restaurant near my house, uh, locked it up on the bike rack, went in, got my to-go order. When I came out, there was like three people around my bike. I was like, hey, what are you doing? Get away from my bike. And they're like, no, no, we just have questions. <laughs> uh, they were all like so interested about it. Uh, it was it was cool. I, I felt like I was in person uh, preaching the uh, the benefits of using an e-bike uh, to get around. Uh, and it's absolutely great. I, I, love, uh, I love my electric e-bike. I try to find any excuse possible to use it instead of taking a car, and uh, it's it's great. Uh, the new Expedition cargo e-bike is specifically designed to make taking cargo easier. It can reach up to 150 miles on a single charge with its double battery setup. It's got a carrying capacity of 450 pounds. You'll be able to bring more gear along for the ride. Really is perfect for carrying gear or, hey, even other passengers. Electric e-bikes cost way less than the competition with quality feature-packed models financed as low as $133 per month. And electric e-bikes are customizable and adjustable to fit your lifestyle. Uh, once you've decided on the e-bike for you, they ship it free to your door, fully assembled. Don't have to take my word for it. Electric has over 250,000 dedicated riders on the road so far. Check out the all-new Expedition uh, Cargo e-bike from Electric. Uh, visit electricebikes.com to learn more about the XP Edition Cargo e-bike and all of the other sweet models Electric has to offer. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C ebikes.com. Did you watch Stranger Things and think, hmm, I wonder if I'll like D&D? Are you watching House of Dragons and think, hmm, what does a dragon smell like? Or are you a D&D veteran who just loves the game? Well, behold, Tales from the Stinky Dragon, a hilarious audio D&D podcast. Uh, join Dungeon Master Gustavo Sirola. Hey, that's me. Each week as he guides Barbara Dunkelman, Chris Damaris, Blaine Gibson, and John Reisinger through a hilarious campaign where they play interns for a group of mighty adventurers known as the Infinites. What? When they arrive for the first day of the job, these newbies discover their world-famous employees. We take that. But when they arrive for the first day of the job, these newbies discover their world-famous employers have been kidnapped. Can these hapless interns save the day or will the back-flipping, ghost-fighting, pirate-loving group need to be saved themselves? Uh, you should check it out. I think it's a great show. I mean, I'm involved with it. I'm a little biased, but uh, if you enjoy my beautiful voice, go give it a listen. It's really fun. Even if you don't know anything about D&D, we try to keep it real loose. Just try to have a lot of fun, tell a lot of jokes, make each other laugh. Uh, go listen and subscribe to Tales from the Stinky Dragon wherever you get podcasts. Uh, that's Tales from the Stinky Dragon. There was actually a couple other cases. These didn't have uh, very much detail on them. So I'm just going to kind of read through them as, you know, supplementary notes here. There was another case of a fire started by a smoking passenger in 1982, which resulted in China Northwest Airlines Flight 2311 evacuating passengers on the runway of Guangzhou Bayun International Airport. The fast developing fire killed 25 passengers and seriously injured 22 uh, passengers and four crew members before destroying the aircraft. There wasn't very much information on that but incident at all. Still, mm -hmm. And then if you want to go even earlier, so... If you like, we were talking about the early days of aviation. Uh -huh. I've got, I've got one for you, Chris. There was an incident in 1937 on an Aeroflot flight from Moscow to Prague that crashed near Harina, Romania, after a passenger lit a cigarette, uh, then disposed of it in the toilet, causing accumulated gas fumes to ignite. Gas fumes, right? They were gas fumes that had collected in the toilet, like from. From the, the plane gas. And okay, I was gas. like, that's different types of gas. No, no, no. no. <laughs> AV gas. Uh, and then all six occupants, it was three passengers and three crew members were killed. How did uh, they accumulate in the one. toilet? I think, like, I don't know. Again, this is another one of those incidents where there wasn't a ton of information. I bet there was a design flaw where, you know, it was the like, fumes mm. from the gas tank escaped and then like collected so, somewhere. And it just so happened it collected in the toilet. And and so wait, did it like explode? I think so. So the toilet in the bathroom exploded on the like that is <laughs> yes. That I'm because someone threw a cigarette into the toilet, not because someone yeah, yeah, ate yeah. something really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but still, yeah. And I'm sure you've seen them. The bathrooms on airplanes are still equipped with ashtrays, um, as there are still passengers willing to violate the smoking ban. And they would need a safe place to dispose of their cigarette butts, you know, in the case that they break the rules. So that's mm. why it remains to this day an FAA requirement to have an ashtray as minimum equipment in or around the lavatory. So minimum equipment means the plane cannot take off unless it's there. So, wow. So should a plane have an ashtray that does not function properly, it must be replaced within three days. Uh, and in 2009... 
there was a British Airways flight from London to Mexico City that was reportedly delayed because the Boeing 747 was in need of an appropriate re- replacement for an ashtray that was out of service. That is crazy. We, we can't take we can't take off because how did it just did someone just put gum in it or something like what? It might have been it might have been you know like stuck where it wouldn't yeah. open or who knows maybe like it got banged up. I I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad you brought that up. There was a we were. I was going through messages uh, for the um, Q and A and 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 stuff to talk about for the uh, first first class episode we're about to record. And Kate moves to Brighton had messaged asking specifically why there are still ashtrays in in the toilets on planes. Well, there you go. You don't want the toilet exploding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, come on. <laughs> in 1976, the U.S. Civil Aeronautics Board banned cigar and pipe smoking on aircraft, but under pressure from tobacco interests, it sought to limit this ban in 1978. Uh, Also, the CAB banned, then unbanned smoking in 1984, with Chairman Dan McKinnon saying, philosophically, I think non-smokers have rights, but it comes into marked conflict with practicalities and the realities of life. So you see, even though, you know, that's why I kind of said at the beginning, even though this seems like a very straightforward thing, it went through a long process to get yeah. to the point where we are nowadays. Yeah, especially factoring in like cigarette lobbyists to, right. who who are actively fighting everything. Right. There's 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 a uh, there's money uh yeah. fighting it. In 2004, a Supreme Court case, Olympic Airways versus Hussein, awarded $700,000 in damages after passenger Dr. Abid Hansen had a fatal anaphylactic reaction from sensitivity to secondhand smoke, oh. even though he was seated in a non-smoking section on Olympic Airways Flight 417 in 1998. So that that's kind of that's another yeah twist to it, right? Uh, as you know, people who. You know, you can, you know, that most people it's like, oh, it's, it's annoying. It's inconveniencing me. I don't like the smell or like long-term secondhand smoke is bad, but if you're getting it, yeah. But this is like a direct secondhand smoke causes person to, to die. Yeah. That's, that's why that's hard. That's pretty hard to argue. Yes. Uh, in 1983 and 1984, congressional hearings were held on the subject of smoking on airliners highlighting the fact that data on airplane cabin air quality were contradictory and no standards existed for acceptable levels of contaminants, such as tobacco smoke. Mind you, this is before that study we talked about, which came out in 1986. Uh-huh. This is when they're all kind of arguing because there is no scientific data yet. So Congress therefore directed the National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences to conduct a study of air quality standards on commercial aircraft and determine whether deficient uh, air quality could be responsible for health problems. And that's the report we talked about. That's that mm. 1986 uh, National Research Council's report, which uh, was the airliner cabin environment, air quality, and safety. And it proposed that smoking be banned on all commercial flights within the United States. Other key findings of the report included that full-time flight attendants received secondhand smoke exposure, approximately equal to living with a pack-a-day smoker, and that potential health effects of secondhand smoke outweighed concerns about smokers' nicotine withdrawal on flights. In February of 1987, the FAA reported to Congress regarding the NRC report uh, on the airliner cabin environment, agreeing with many of the NRC's findings, though asserting that more study was required before a smoking ban could be recommended. So that's, this is when the window starts closing. Now there's Mm -hmm. scientific data, there's like empirical evidence that this is not good. And I'm sure there's, at the same time, in respect to, to planes, the same thing is happening everywhere. I mean, right? Restaurants uh, and, and, and other, like just yeah. in general, the, like places where smoke, the areas where you can smoke publicly are probably shrinking. Right. Uh, I know I definitely remember being a kid and going to restaurants, like you said, and there were smoking and non-smoking sections, but I bet, I don't know where you could find that any, anymore yeah. nowadays. But yeah, I think that this is around that time where the where things start changing and yeah. you know smoking's not allowed in these confined spaces in general anymore. I went to um, to Singapore a couple of years ago, Chris, uh-huh. and you could not even smoke outside unless you were in a designated smoking area outside. Wow! Like there's like mark at least like, where I was in Singapore, there were markings on the ground like you can smoke inside this box it, even it, though you're outside throughout the entire city area. Yeah, like or was Every, it? Everywhere I saw, uh, wow. it was like that. Uh, again, I, I was only there for like a week, so I don't mm-hmm. 
know the law behind that, but that's definitely something I saw. And I know, I think I took a few photos with my phone. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> oh, maybe that's what I'll post on, <laughs> on our social media. <laughs> I'll see if I can find those. So in November of 1987, a study by the National Cancer Institute and the Canadian Minister of Health and Welfare and Air Canada published in, uh, in JAMA in February of 1989 found that passengers in non-smoking sections were exposed to cigarette smoke, in some cases at levels comparable to those experienced by passengers seated in smoking sections. Uh, in the NCI's press release about the study, Surgeon General Coop urged that cigarette smoking be banned on all commercial flights. Legislation to ban smoking on all domestic flights permanently was introduced in the U.S. Senate in March of 1989. The House Transportation Committee's Aviation Subcommittee held hearings in June regarding legislation limiting or banning smoking on airlines. Testimony cited a survey conducted by the American Association of Respiratory Care, which indicated that more than 80% of 30,000 passengers surveyed wanted to see a permanent extension of the ban, and the FAA had received fewer than 120 complaints relating to the ban's enforcement during a period when 445 million people traveled. That's kind of really, uh, really highlighting it. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, 445 million people traveled and there were less than 120 complaints. <laughs> Meanwhile, 80% of people surveyed wanted to see an extension of the ban. At that point, it's like, yeah. all right, it's, it's pretty clear yeah. um, which way the, the wind's blowing. And, and it's funny, what, what, what year is this? 1989, 80% um, wanted to see an extension of the ban. Uh, that means 20%, I guess, either had no opinion or wanted to see it go away. I wonder if that's around the percentage of people who were smoking at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a random question. Did airlines sell cigarettes or hand them oh, out for free? Was it know. like an amenity? That's a good question, Chris. I don't know. If I had to guess, I would guess that they probably had free cigars for people in first class. That seems like, I don't know that, but that seems right to me. Yeah. So after all of that, in 1990, Congress made permanent the ban on smoking on domestic flights of two hours or less and expanded it to include all domestic flights of six hours or less, which we talked about. I don't know where you would fly. Currently, I just did a quick uh, Google search. Flying nonstop from New York to LA is six hours and 25 minutes. Six hours. Oh. So you would barely get around that ban. You could smoke on that flight. <laughs> You're like, man, I really need to smoke. I'm going to go to L.A. I wonder if people <laughs> would take slightly more inconvenient flights <laughs> so they could to be able to smoke. In an effort to influence the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, the Coalition on Smoking or Health, which was a it's a now defunct coalition of the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, the American Cancer Asso uh, Society. Uh, they, in concert with the European Bureau for Action on Smoking Pollution, the Canadian Cancer Society, and the International Organization of uh, Consumers Unions, kicked off the Campaign for Smoke-Free Skies Worldwide. Because remember, so far, we've only talked about the United States. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, this, these organizations globally who are coming together trying to get um, this kind of legislation all around the world. And they try to encourage groups from different countries to work together to launch a long-term effort to achieve smoke-free airline flights everywhere. Hmm. Uh, and we've talked about the uh, ISAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, they're based in Montreal. It's a United Nations affiliated body that sets international standards for air transportation. And its standards must be agreed to by member nations uh, who were called contracting states. So it's like the world's FAA. That might not be the perfect uh, analogy, but it's like they just set the rules globally for aviation. All kinds of aviation. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess that's a good, that's how you get big change passes. Like, right. Yeah. That's also how you end up with things that are standardized. Yeah. And conform it. Yeah. Cause then you, you know, and it's not like, well, even people who work there with airlines, they're not having to constantly educate people because of different rules and different regulations on it. Or just think, think about like flying a plane. Like, let's say you're, flying a a passenger plane in europe right going yeah. from what before the european union before the eu it's like oh we just crossed an invisible line in the sky <laughs> all the rules are different now yeah <laughs> uh so it's good that there is this uniformity uh but anyway as a result of all this pressure uh the international civil aviation organization approved a resolution in 1992 to eliminate smoking on international commercial flights by july 1st 1996 and though not legally binding, the resolution did present an accepted standard for airlines. And the campaign also encouraged Canada and Australia to ban smoking on all commercial flights. 
And as a further step, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada mutually agreed to ban smoking on all flights between the countries in 1994. And let me tell you, if you're that's one of the longest flights I've ever been on in my life, is the United States to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can make it not smoking on that flight, you can make it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. That is a long flight. That is a very long flight. In December 1994, eight airlines, uh, American Airlines, British Airways, Continental, KLM, Northwest, TWA, United, and US Air, jointly petitioned the Department of Transportation for antitrust immunity so that they could work together to plan smoking bans on international flights. Uh, Delta, American, United, Cathay Pacific, Singapore Airlines, and Virgin Atlantic had by this time already implemented their own bans. So they're, they're kind of like, hey, you know, normally we can't work together because of, uh, uh, of antitrust laws. Can we work together on this one so we can coordinate <laughs> it? <laughs> and then this, these, this like domino effect of airlines just continued yeah. throughout the 90s. Uh, Sabina, Swiss Air, Austrian Airlines banned smoking on transatlantic flights in 1997. Uh, and United and American banned smoking on all of their flights. In 1998, Brazil banned smoking on all domestic and international flights. And among private carriers, Royal Air Maroc, uh, British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, Lufthansa, Aer Lingus, Finnair, Iceland Air, Scandinavian Air, banned smoking on all their flights. What was the last airline or what? where can you still smoke? That's a good question. Let me, I have a few more dates and okay, airlines sorry. here. Let me read this. No, no, no. And then let me read this and then we'll, we'll talk about that. In 1999, Saudi Airlines, Japan Airlines, Aeromexico, Span Air, Air Zimbabwe, Qatar Airways all followed suit. Uh, and in 2000, when the USA banned smoking all domestic international flights enacted as part of an aviation overhaul bill. And by that time, 97.7% of all US international flights were already smoke free due to both governmental regulation mm -hmm. and voluntary action by airlines. And that same year, Air France and Sudan Airways banned smoking on their flights. And a few stragglers joined the Smoke Free Club in 2001 and 2002 uh, with Emirates Airline, Middle East Airlines, Biman, Bangladesh Airlines, and Saudi Arabian Airlines implementing their own smoking bans. That's the last dates I have here in my document. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can... I, I bet, Chris, there's got to be a country somewhere out there where you can still smoke on a plane. I bet, too. I, private... Private airlines, I think you can. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, Chris. Uh, you know, I can fly that little Cessna. If you want to smoke a cigarette in there, no. I think you can. <laughs> I don't want to. It, it, it's funny you say that. In, in uh, the plane I did most of my private pilot training in, there's a uh, uh, little ashtray in it. And I never, you know, obviously, I don't smoke. I never use the ashtray, but it's convenient because I can clip my headset onto it. <laughs> so I like, I like having that ashtray there just because I can clip my headset uh, controls right there. Um. I, this is, I, I'm not sure how research this is, but are there any airline f flights where smoking is allowed? Short answer to this is no. Smoking is banned on all commercial airline flights. Then there's a sub note. Although it is rare, a few international on airline companies such as Cubana, Iran Air, Air Algeria still allow smoking in restricted sections in some of their flights. So I guess. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I found that. Cubana banned smoking on international flights in 2014. Uh, that m they may have been the last holdout, and that's mm. according to uh, the points guy. Okay, that's wild. That is taking yeah. this and, and e, e cigs aren't allowed, right? No, no, okay, definitely not. Yeah. Well, now, now, Chris, I want to go fly a plane and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Just <do it. laughs> that sounds like me when I was. When I turned 18, I wanted to exercise all my new rights, so I, I, uh, I went and I bought some cigarettes and some, a Playboy and a lottery ticket, and uh, maybe I, vo I also voted. <laughs> <laughs> what a weekend. It wasn't all at once, and I don't even smoke cigarettes, so I think I just bought them just because... Mm -hmm. I bought I bought a pack of cigarettes once when I was was how old I was nineteen or twenty. I bought it from that Seven Eleven over at like Tenth and Lamar. Uh -huh. uh, I bought a pack of cigarettes there, and I tried smoking a cigarette, and I was like, "Yeah, I, it's not for me." Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was like walking by like a bunch of smokers who were like uh, standing outside of that ACC campus at Rio Grande. They were mm. all like, and I was like, "Hey, does anybody want this?" And I just gave them like <laughs> the pack of cigarettes. <laughs> You know, Gus, I might be wrong. I want to say my first time smoking a cigarette 
was this was forever ago was in the sound booth at Rooster Teeth at our old office when I did I did this silly sketch it was like a, a I was playing Bob Dylan recording uh music or something I was doing a, Oh yeah yeah and I was like smoking a cigarette and doing a bad Bob Dylan impression in the sound booth and I remember that, that. Yeah. Was, hey, 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 and just like <laughs> and smoking a cigarette the whole time. It was just like filling the sound booth <laughs> with smoke. That might have been my first cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Um, okay. Uh, in October of 2015, the United States Department of Transportation ended all types of in-flight smoking when it prohibited the use of electronic cigarettes. You were just asking about mm-hmm. that. Uh, as well as transporting such devices in checked luggage because of the fire risk from their batteries. In July 2019, an Air China aircraft made an emergency descent after cabin oxygen levels dropped, which had been linked to a co-pilot smoking an e-cigarette during the flight. Uh, wow. that's, a, that, that's a little scary. Today, air travelers around the globe are able to enjoy smoke-free in, uh, environments in flight, and violators of the smoking ban can face a fine for smoking or vaping on a flight that can range from $2 to $4,000. Uh, by itself, it's not a jailable offense, but it can quickly escalate if a person is found to have tampered with a smoke detector or failed to comply with a crew member's instructions, such as to stop smoking. Uh, generally, while a person may be arrested and removed from a flight for smoking or vaping, uh, unless there was more to the incident, there'll only be a fine imposed. However, be warned, on some international flights, depending on the destination country, a person could be arrested upon arrival and put into jail. Hmm. So there are, there are differences depending on where you're going. Uh, but that's it. A very long, convoluted, <laughs> meandering story about uh, smoking on airplanes. I just, I was just you think about them being put in jail, and it's it's the, a separate little jail, like a little, like what you said in Singapore, where they just have a square <laughs> where they, they, <laughs> they're put in smokers' jail. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's it. I, this I I don't know. I think this this subject's really interesting. Cause, yeah. Uh, it happened a lot more recently, I think, than than most people realize and most people think about. Yeah, that's it is when you, sometimes when you take apart and and look really look at the dates of things, it's it's wild. Mm-hmm. But that's it. We'll be back in uh, in a couple more weeks with another uh, supplemental episode, and then after that, we'll be back with uh, more regular Black Box Down episodes. And oh, but we are going to be making a uh, a first class episode. Was that what you were going to say? I'm sorry, yeah, Chris, I yeah. So we'll have that, and we'll be talking about some news articles and answering some Q and A that been sent in, and just uh, yeah, a few other things that people have asked us to uh, chat about. Yeah. Uh, all right, and you can learn more about that at blackboxdownpod.com, and you can support us either directly in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the website, or uh, by subscribing to Rooster Teeth First. And if you're just looking for something else to listen to. That's besides Black Box Sound. Uh, we are just finished up the finale of our big uh, campaign, our big story um, for Tales from Stinky Dragon. It's kind of our comedy um, tabletop gaming podcast. It's don't need to know anything about D anD D or gaming. It's just fun comedy, uh, very immersive and 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 silly. Uh, I just look for Tales from Stinky Dragon anywhere you listen to podcasts. Highly recommend it. Gus is the DM. I'm uh, in it as a character. Uh, called gum gum uh and we'll talk more about that um later because of our, we have a bonus episode where we're gonna have another cast member on it soon but it's a good thing yeah. to check out if you want to yeah find something else to listen to thumbs up all right thanks for <laughs> listening <laughs>